diving deep into the secular and the sexuality by looking at the concept of religious trauma syndrome. So whether you work as a therapist or work with a therapist, I hope you'll give us a call with your questions here at 512-686-0279. That's 512-686-0279. Daryl, thanks so much for joining us. I'm glad to be here and talking about uh, one of my pet peeves now, right now. Yeah. <laughs> right. So, I mean, I guess this really is kind of the crux of what secular sexuality is all about. This idea that uh, religion can be incredibly traumatizing, uh, particularly to our sexuality. So, I mean, yeah. this is really the, the all of it. It's the center of it. I yeah. Think. Right. <laughs> Yeah. And, and it's a handle that we've only recently gotten, a linguistic mm -hmm. handle, if you will. We've got a name for what we've been seeing for years. You know, you're a clinician, and you've been seeing it. I've been seeing it. Well, we didn't have a name, name to put on it. Yeah, so that, that name you're talking about is religious trauma syndrome. Right, What right. What does that, that handle, that, I guess, construct or just collection of words add up to? Well, first of all, let's, let's break them up because I want to just talk about I want to talk about religious trauma, and that is when something related to religion creates a, tra a potentially tra traumatizing uh, event. Mm -hmm. For example, right. you're uh, you're an, an eight-year-old kid, and you're masturbating, and your father finds you masturbating and beats the hell out of you. Mm -hmm. That is a tra that's an event. Not everybody's going to get traumatized by that, mm. but it has a high potential to be traumatizing. So that's that is a, tr a trauma event, but if you we we know that lots of humans, all of us, go through traumatic experiences, but not everybody is traumatic traumatized by every bad experience. Sure. So I don't want to overdo this whole thing. I I just want to say that you have probably experienced a events in your life that were traumatizing to uh, some people and not to you. Mm. Sure. And that's that's normal. It's natural. It's called resilience. And in some situations, you're more resilient and can resist the um, the potential damage of that event than somebody else. I mean, two people in the same car and they get in a car wreck, mm -hmm. and one person is traumatized by it and has to go, to the, you know, go through all sorts of of help and therapy to get get over it. And the other person, you know, walks away and no physical harm to either person maybe but one person responds to it very different than the other person mm. so that's what we're talking about here today there there are religious religiously related events that can be traumatizing the other side of the coin is when we add the word syndrome we mean that there's a a, a cluster of of symptoms that come with that and that's when we can call it a syndrome because it's got you know you you're having nightmares you can't sleep you, your fear of hell keeps coming back. Um, you, you can't have a good relationship with another sexual relationship with another human being because you're traumatized or because you're, you're having those, the, you're reliving the experience of your dad beating you or whatever. Mm -hmm. That is a syndrome. And, and that's a, it's, and it's an important distinction here because sure. many of us have had bad experiences and many of us are still dealing with those, but doesn't mean we're suffering from religious trauma syndrome. It may mean we're suffering from religious trauma. We could all have some trauma, and, and I dare say a lot of people on this planet have got trauma that's directly related to some kind of religious training. The purity culture bullshit. Yeah. You know, if you were raised in the purity culture, you're probably dealing with some trauma around that. But you might not, you might not show the symptomology that would, that would create a whole structure of, mm -hmm. of, of, of symptoms, if you will. Yeah, I'd say like the most, most of our calls on this show are related in some way to some religious trauma. Uh, well, absolutely. Yeah. yeah, they are. So that I think that's an important distinction and mm -hmm. helps us kind of frame the discussion that we're, we're going to have tonight. Yeah, and, well, uh, another question that's not in my notes, but that I, I feel like is really important to highlight as we're talking about the difference between trauma and a traumatic syndrome and, and these different things is that idea of resiliency, because I think we so often can put a moral value on that uh, mm -hmm. as if, you know, my experience wasn't bad enough to justify my symptoms or uh, what is it about me that wasn't resilient enough or, or those kinds of things uh, when in reality it's not a it's not a moral issue in any kind of way so what not at all what no. sort of creates that resiliency or maybe uh, protects us or, or potentially primes us for trauma do we yeah. even know yeah we don't know I don't think I think we have broad understanding of why some people are more resilient than others I think there's personality variables mm -hmm. for example um i mean you and we all know people who grew, who said i've been an atheist since i was five years old it never took mm -hmm. it just 
Well, it's I, I liken this actually to um, let me back up a little bit. You know, the whole planet right now is concerned about coronavirus, right? Sure. But we can look out, and even in China, you see that n- at least ninety percent of the people are either symptom free. They've got the the virus, but they're symptom free, or they have very mild symptoms. Ninety percent. Sure. But there's ten percent that are in a hospital, and one two percent that are dying. Mm-hmm. So why is that? <laughs> <laughs> We don't really know exactly. We know it has something to do with the immune system. And I'm pretty sure that we have what I call a rational immune system. That we, uh, some people are just born with, with, with a certain personality characteristic that allows them to resist certain kinds of influence around them. But even that person put under enough pressure and in, in the right situation will probably experience trauma. Mm-hmm. So n- nobody is 100% resilient. But in this in, in situation A with personality characteristic B, you will be more resistant. But in situation C with personality characteristic B, you will succumb. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Same personality, just different situation. Uh, let me go back a little bit because this is, I think, fascinating stuff. Everybody knows about Pavlov. Yeah. Pavlov's dogs. Yeah, classical conditioning. Yeah, we all studied that if you went to psychology. Even psychology in high school, you learned about Pavlov. Right. What you do not learn about Pavlov is what happened after after Stalin took over the Soviet Union. Pavlov's career stopped right there, as far as we know. But he continued for another almost 30 years. And in that process he learned some incredible interest incredibly interesting information he accidentally traumatized dogs hmm. now he didn't intend it but there was a flood in the laboratory and some of the dogs died as a result of drowning and other dogs watched their their buddies drowning yeah and that traumatized them when they came back into the lab after the flood was finished then they saw the change of the personalities of the dogs who'd seen their buddies die yeah. Okay. Well, what all if, the while that this is going on, Stalin is in control of Russia. So I'm yeah. sure it felt very, uh, very important research to be doing at the yeah. time. Yeah. <laughs> well, and Stalin liked Pavlov. Pavlov hated Stalin. Mm. But Stalin was Stalin knew what Pavlov was doing, and Stalin put secret agents uh, in the form of graduate students, so to speak, into his laboratory. Never trust a grad student. And they, <laughs> and they studied this. So, so we've got these people in the 1920s and 30s studying basically how to traumatize dogs. And wow. from that, they start practicing on humans. They teach it to the Koreans and they teach it to the Chinese. That's where we get the co- whole concept of brainwashing mm. basically comes out of Pavlov's discoveries. Nobody talks about this. I mean, you almost can't find a reference, to it, but that's where it comes from. So what I'm, what the reason I went there, I mean, why we've gone down this rabbit <laughs> hole, <laughs> is because we know you can intentionally traumatize dogs. Mm-hmm. Well, dogs, think about this. Dogs have got the same DNA we've got. There's actually four personal, basic personality types in dogs. There's five basic personality types in humans. We're not that different. So our brains, a dog's brain can be programmed and can be reprogrammed through traumatic experiences like drowning mm-hmm. or beating. You know, we all know what a dog looks like that's been abused. Yeah. Well, that dog is expressing trauma. Mm-hmm. Now, it's not religious trauma. <laughs> but, you can hope. But yeah. humans express those same kind of things. So that's why, that's why this is so important because we have, when you, when you experience trauma and, and a syndrome comes out of it, what it tells us is your brain was literally reprogrammed. Mm. And you have now become hypervigilant. I mean, you look at the dog that was abused. He's always, he or she's always watching the environment. Humans are the same thing. Children, same thing. So you become hypervigilant. You start interpreting danger where danger doesn't exist. You, uh, you're on hair trigger emotions. You can't, you respond to things that very quickly that most people wouldn't. So those are all kind of symptoms of what we would call religious trauma syndrome. And, uh, I mean, even, even this, <laughs> you're driving down the road, you're an atheist, you drive around the road and you see a sign that says Jesus saves. Do you get a bit of a twinge when you see that shit? I mean, I, yeah. I still do. 
And I've been out for a long time. I mean, organ music. Uh, organ, or, yeah. Like very uh, simple C, D, G type guitar playing. Mm. It just puts me right back there. Driving yeah. through San Antonio is just mm. <laughs> crazy. <laughs> just the billboards, so many. <laughs> Really threatening to religious billboards. So there's a there's a lot to this. We could talk about it all night long, but I just want to go over a few of the symptoms. I've mentioned things like uh, nightmares, intrusive thoughts is is a very important component of it. I can't. I, I wake up in the morning or I have nightmares around fear of hell, and I can't get it out of my head all day long. Mm. I I can't. I, I I can get to sleep for two hours, then I wake up with nightmares about hell. Uh, also, cognitive loops. I can't stop thinking about. Um, how sinful I've been today because I masturbated mm. or, or whatever. And then, of course, you got just classic depression that can come from it. What we, what we know is that people's brains literally get reprogrammed. And, and I mean physically, you see a change in the hormones, change the way they process, um, you, you know, the different hormones that the brain produces, serotonin, dopamine, all that sort of stuff. And it, so you have less protection. You're... Your brain is no longer able to protect itself against outside influences. That's why you become hypervigilant. Mm. We all know about this PTSD. Right. Nobody disputes PTSD anymore. But look at 50 years ago, we didn't even know what that was. We right. called it shell, shell shock, shock in World War yeah. One, or battle or being fatigue, a coward, or being a coward, yeah. any of those things. But in fact, we now know that when you experience watching your buddies get killed in battle affects you. Mm -hmm. Just like those dogs watching their buddies get drowned in that laboratory with Pavlov affected them. If I'm in a family and I'm watching my my brothers or sisters get abused for not uh, not um, memorizing their Bible verses and everybody's getting spanked around me and maybe I'm next, mm -hmm. that is just the same thing as as we see in the dogs or you see in, in a wartime. So we now know, and this is the first time this has happened, that we've been able to label what religion does to people. Mm. And until recently, you go through graduate school as a therapist and you're kind of taught, if not explicitly, implicitly, to, oh, stay away from religion. Got to <laughs> You got to respect the beliefs of the client. Yeah. Right. Well, I'm Absolutely. here to say, yeah, you can respect them, but you don't have to, you don't have to avoid the very, uh, the, the very cause of what they're in there for. Mm -hmm. And too many, too many therapists will go all day long and never mention, well, could, could your trauma be related to religion? Mm -hmm. That's a simple question. It's not you're dissing their, their religion. You're asking a pertinent question. And with the concept of religious trauma that we've got now, we now have a way to educate our clients and then let them make the decision. I'm not saying go make an atheist out of your clients, although if you want to, go <laughs> yeah, for it. Yeah. <laughs> but that's not, that's not what we're trained to do, and that's not our purpose. Our purpose is to help people deal with their trauma. And, and it, it just pisses me off, as you know, <laughs> to see therapists that will not help the client get to the root of the problem. Mm -hmm. And if the root of the problem is religion and you're avoiding it, you're just going all around it, all around it, but you're never coming right out and naming it, mm -hmm then you can't ever help them get through the trauma. And that's that's why I'm so passionate about talking on, on the show today. Yeah, it's, no, th that's so true because, uh, you know, we all have parents of some stripe or some fashion. And when a client comes into my office, certainly I'm going to ask about that. I'm going to ask about their family and, and these types of things. And while I would approach it with the same respectfulness because I don't necessarily know. Are they close to their parents? Or have these been good relationships? Like, how, what's the experience? All of these kinds of things. And yet, psychology has no problem accusing, you know, mothers in particular of mm -hmm. being the cause of all issues. And we don't have that same type of, uh, of just carefulness, of over-carefulness. Mm -hmm. And when it comes to religion, we're not really trained or encouraged in any way to even ask about, like, no. what is your relationship no. with your religion or what is your religious history or whatever, the same way we might be expected to talk about a family history. Yeah. And How much of a barrier would you say that is to therapy? Like, I mean, can you still treat the trauma without, uh, like, personally addressing the source? You might be able to, but why do you want to go to so much extra trouble? Well, if I don't. It, <laughs> if it takes 10, it might take 10 sessions right. to deal with it, or one session if you do it straightforward. It, it really can be that big a difference mm. in the ability to, to treat it. 
and and the other side, and this is an important kind of semi answer to your question, Sarah, <laughs> is that so many therapists out there have religious ideas of their own. Yeah, and they've got their own mm -hmm. supernatural beliefs. Well, if I if I have to deal with your supernatural beliefs in therapy, maybe I have to deal with my own too. I mean, and maybe yeah. maybe religion had a traumatic impact on me mm -hmm. as a therapist, and I haven't dealt with that shit. That is a big problem among therapists, as they are not dealing with some of their own shit. And we all we know that a lot of therapists go into therapy to deal with their own crap. I mean, sure. And then they don't successfully deal with it, and, <laughs> and the clients end up paying for paying them to pay for. You know what I mean? <laughs> oh, wow. So anyway, yeah. yeah. I can't count the number of times I've gone to like a new therapist um, and only to find you know that they're immediately trying to subtly push some sort of belief. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, I, I, I've yeah. made this comment on this show before, but I find it just baffling the number of clinicians I know who have a master's degree of science mm -hmm. and a deck of tarot cards oh, in yeah. their office. <laughs> sure. And <clears throat> it's, it's seen as being eclectic and open-minded uh, at the same time as, you know, pushing these evidence-based practices, which is the, the right perspective to be taking, but doing so in a not always scientific mind. Yeah, right, right, right. right. Uh, and, that, and that's why we've got the Secular Therapy Project, because we want to make sure people are getting, they're not walking into a situation where there's... Yeah, uh, yeah, so very quickly, just yeah. to remind everybody about secular pro uh, seculartherapyproject.org, which is just a yeah. great listing of uh, quality secular therapists. There, there is one piece that people can do on their own and kind of check what we're talking about. You can go online, go to the uh, CDC, Centers for Disease Control, and look mm -hmm. up Adverse Childhood Experiences Survey. Yeah, and I, I should mention that there is a link to that in the footnotes for this episode mm -hmm. already up. Excellent. Good. And it's, it's a good way to look at, did you have any, I, a, a lot of adult tra trauma that we experience in adulthood started in childhood. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. So there's, and, and it's called adverse childhood experiences. Not all adverse child experiences turn into trauma, of mm -hmm. course, as we've said earlier. Some people are resilient in certain situations. But you can get on that, take the test and see what, how you score. Now, you're going to notice when you take the test, there's not a single mention of religion anywhere. Oh, wow. There, There's hardly any... I think... The, I, I like the test. I'm glad they've got it, but I think it's it's got some major flaws. It's got some flaws. Not major, but flaws. And one of those flaws is... It never identifies religion as a potential source of trauma. I feel like if it did, that would have been removed from the site. Probably, the yeah, past four right. Years. Just it's like true. all the global warming stuff's been removed from the site. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I wouldn't want to get politically. Sorry, 